you have your Bibles today, would you join me in the book of Isaiah? The book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, verse number 39, chapter number 39. Isaiah, chapter number 39. For several months, I have been traveling around and crisscrossing our state, trying to bring churches together to stand up for our Judeo-Christian belief system. And I have shared with them a message that I want to share with us today. I've preached parts of this in this pulpit, but today I want to spend some time on talking about what we're about as a church and as a nation. And on this Sunday before the huge rally on Tuesday, I wanted to acquaint us with why we are doing what we're doing. In the book of Isaiah, chapter number 39, in verse number 8, the Bible says, Then said Hezekiah to Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord, which thou hast spoken. And he said, Moreover, for there shall be peace and truth in my days. If you're familiar with this story, it goes like this. In the previous chapter of the book of Isaiah, God sent Isaiah down to the house of Hezekiah and told him to set his house in order that he was going to die. The Bible says that Hezekiah turned his face towards the wall and began to remind God of some things in his life. And as a result of that, God sent Isaiah back down the second time to Hezekiah's house and said, God has heard your prayer and he has added 15 years to your life. The king up north in Babylon heard about the extension of this life. And so in chapter 39, verse number 1, he comes down and pays King Hezekiah a visit. They did not talk about Hezekiah's God because the king in Babylon did not know Hezekiah's God. But the king from Babylon brought a gift and, he, and shared the gift with King Hezekiah and congratulated him on his healing and the fact that he had 15 additional years given to him. When he came down to the palace of Hezekiah, Hezekiah made a drastic mistake. Hezekiah took the king from Babylon on a tour, and he showed the king all of his armaments, all of his gold, all of his silver. And while the king from Babylon is looking at all of the possessions of Hezekiah, he's making a mental image. He's remembering where the armaments are, where the silver, the gold, the munitions, where all of it's located. Because the king from Babylon has already conquered some six or eight nations up north, and he's got his eye now on Hezekiah's kingdom. And so as he comes into this kingdom, and Hezekiah gives him the personal tour, He's making mental notations. Well, he said, when I sweep down here with my army, I know where all the munitions are. I know where all of the silver is located. I know where all the gold is located. After the king from Babylon took his leave, God sent Isaiah back again to visit with King Hezekiah. And he said to Hezekiah, who were these people? What did they want? And Hezekiah said... I have shown them all that is in my house. Listen closely. 
I have shown them all that is in my house. And God's man Isaiah then said to King Hezekiah, I've got a word for you from the Lord. Hezekiah, the day is going to come in the future. When that king from up north is going to bring his army and they're going to swoop down here where you now live. And they're going to take everything that you own, everything that your fathers, listen, everything that your fathers have given to you, they're going to take away from you. They're going to take your gold, they're going to take your silver. But worst of all, your two sons that are yet to be born unto you, they are going to take out of this country. And they're going to export your two sons to foreign soil. And your two sons will eventually become eunuchs in a foreign household. Hezekiah, your two sons are going to be taken away from you. And they're going to be taken into captivity. Now, when Hezekiah heard that message from God's man, he made two astounding statements. You find those two statements in our text verse. Number one, when he heard the man of God, he said in verse number eight, Good is the word of the Lord. Now, we all go on record today saying amen to that. We all go on record today saying good is the word of the Lord. Because you have a book in front of you today that's not an ordinary book. Let's get it straight. You have a Bible in front of you today that is as much the word of God as if God stood in this pulpit and quoted it to you. We believe in the inspiration of the word of God. We believe that every word... And the Bible was divinely inspired of God, and that holy men of old wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit of God. And we believe in the preservation of the Scriptures, that God has preserved His Word from generation to generation, and that we still have the Word of God. We believe that we're saved, not with incorruptible seed, but but not with corruptible seed, but with incorruptible seed, which is the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And we believe that heaven and earth shall pass away, but the Word of God shall not pass away, because it is forever settled in heaven. He was right. Good is the Word of God. Great is the Word of God. But he made a second statement, and that's the statement that the message is about today. Young people up in the balcony, I want you to listen to my statement. And everybody else in the building, everybody listening to my voice, I don't want you to miss my next statement. Because as I quote what King Hezekiah had to say, we find the mindset of the average home in America, and we find the mindset of the average church in America, and we find the mindset of the average Christian movement in America because King Hezekiah made an astounding statement when he said in verse 8, For there shall be peace and truth in my days. Now, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, get a hold of what he said. Isaiah the prophet had said to him that his two children will be taken out of his house and taken off into a foreign country. But King Hezekiah says, I have the assurance... That during these 15 years that's been given to me, I will have no wars to fight. I have the assurance that there will be no combat with an outside enemy coming into this country. Neither will I have to take my soldiers into a foreign land. What he said was, as long as I live, there will be peace and prosperity in the land. And I don't have to worry about incoming armies. And that although God through Isaiah said that my two children, my own flesh and blood, will eventually be taken out of this country and be taken into a foreign country, I, Hezekiah said, it doesn't really concern me. 
I will let the next generation fend for itself. I will let the next generation fight for itself. I will let the next generation fight their own battles. And although I have the promise from the Word of God that my children will be held captive in a foreign land, it doesn't matter to me, Hezekiah said. I've got the promise of God. There's going to be peace and prosperity in my lifetime. So I'll enjoy the comfort zone that I live in. I'll let the next generation fight their battles. I'll let my children fight their battles, my grandkids fight their battles. I'm content, he said, just to live in peace and prosperity and whatever happens in the next generation, then they will have to take the stand. They will have to fight. They will have the circumstances that they will have to confront in the next generation. But I'm just going to enjoy the peace and the prosperity that I am now enjoying. And I say to you in this building and everybody listening to my voice and that will view this service, that is basically the mindset of this generation. The basic mindset of this generation is, I'm, I'm having it the best I've ever had it. I have it better than my parents had it. I've got a comfort zone. I've got a little money in the bank. I've got a little money in my pocket. I've got a roof over my head. I've got carpet on the floor. I've got a relatively good retirement program. Uh, nobody is uh, coming into the shores of this country. We're not having to fight any battles on the home front. I'm getting along pretty good. I'm in a comfort zone. So why should I be concerned about what's happening in my nation? And that kind of mentality has got us in a fix that the average person knows nothing about. Because we're losing something in this country. And my generation has already lost more than it should have ever been willing to give up. When I went to school over in Yadkin County, in a little place called Courtney High School, we used to begin our classroom in the morning with a Bible study. When we went to lunch, we had prayer. My teacher used to pray before we went to lunch. I heard my dad on numerous occasions say that in that same school that he attended, that they used to bring in local pastors from the local churches in the community, and they would dismiss the classes. And in those old schoolhouses, they had the auditorium right in the center of the school, and the classrooms surrounded the auditorium. And they would bring the students out of those auto, out of those classrooms, out into the auditorium, and they would bring in a man of God in the community and preach and had revival services in the schoolhouse. Just a few weeks ago, in Wilmington, North Carolina, let me say it again, not in Russia, not in Cuba, not in Saudi Arabia, but in Wilmington, North Carolina, a young man was handing out a little piece of literature that said it's a sin for people to be caught up in a homosexual lifestyle. And the school principal looked at the literature and suspended the young man from school. Ten students in the state of Washington just a few weeks ago, tried to get permission from the principal to have prayer meeting before school ever started in a room where no one was meeting or even outside or in the cafeteria. And when they were refused to come together and pray, when they were refused the opportunity to pray, they stepped outside to pray. And as a result of that, they were suspended for ten days out of school. That story can be repeated times untold 
all over this country. And nobody cares. Nobody is concerned. We are in our comfort zone. And we don't want anybody to wake us. We don't want anybody to shake us. We don't want anybody to disturb us. Why, we got people that can't even be faithful to church. And you can't expect them to stand up for the freedoms that we're losing in this nation. Don't you listen to me. We're no longer on the playground. We're on the battleground. We're fighting a war in this country. 1962, nine Supreme Court justices dressed in black, symbolic of death for them, said that it is against the law in this country for a kid to bow their head in a classroom and pray. For 150 plus years in the United States of America, it had been perfectly legal. As a matter of fact, our school systems in this country originated in schoolhouses, and the pastor was the teacher. Most of us have heard of the McGuffey Reader. The McGuffey Reader was the, re was, the, was the book that colonial America cut its teeth on, and it was filled with Scripture. It was filled with the Word of God. Our forefathers that came to the shores of this country, they came here for Judeo-Christian principles... And there was a time in this country when it was not against the law to name the name of Jesus and to read the Word of God. 1962, with no precedent in any court decision in the history of the United States of America, the Supreme Court justices said now it's against the law to pray in the public school sector. One year later, 1963, the same Supreme Court justices said that it is now against the law to take the Word of God into the classroom. And yet all, most of our founding forefathers quoted the Word of God as the basic book upon which this society was to be founded. From the year 1760 until 1805, there was a study made in this nation to try to determine what influenced our forefathers in the great statements of declaration that they brought. They went through 15,000 documents and they came to the conclusion that of the decisions made in, this, in, this, in the founding of this nation, that 34% of the decisions came directly from the Word of God, and that 60% of all the decisions of our forefather came because they were influenced by the Word of God. Right here in America. In 1972, the same Supreme Court justices declared that the most dangerous place in America for a person to live is in the womb of their mother. Since that time, 45 million lives have been murdered. One of the most ungodly, dangerous, sickening, debased things I know of is this thing of abortion. And more especially, partial birth abortion. When that child is basically born and a doctor takes a pair of scissors or sharp instrument and plunges it into the back of the skull of a little baby and inserts a tube there while that little baby is kicking and screaming and breathing and sucks its little brain out of its head. When they put a saline solution in the womb of the mother and the little baby reaves in pain while the saline solution literally burns its skin off of its body and then they insert a tube and suck the little baby out in pieces. That is worse than barbaric. In 1980, the Supreme Court said that it is now against the law for Ten Commandments to hang on the schoolroom wall. 
Because in the words of one of the Supreme Court justices, if those Ten Commandments are hanging on the wall of the school, it might entice one of the young people to look at those Ten Commandments and think about God. 1985, they said it is now against the law here in the United States of America to have prayer at graduation. Last year, a young lady out in Arkansas who was the head of her class, she had the top score in her class, was asked to give the address at the graduation. The principal said he wanted to see her address before she gave it. And he looked at it and he said, you've got references in here to God and the Bible. You must extract that. And she said, I cannot do that. She said, I made these good grades. I'm in this position in this class because my Lord has enabled me to achieve this feat, and I will not deny Him. They said to her, if you read these words, we will cut your microphone off. And she stood up on that day, and she started reading verbatim, what was on her heart, giving God the glory and the honor for enabling her to be successful in that classroom. And they cut her microphone off. <coughs> Dr. Jerry Falwell, Liberty University, heard about it. Called her up one day. He said, I appreciate your stand. I want to give you a four-year scholarship to Liberty University. We would like for you to come up here and view our university. And she came with her sister. And they're looking over the campus and she's not making a commitment. And they find out behind the scenes that her sister wants to be with her in school and they don't want to be separated. They call Dr. Falwell and he comes over and he says to her sister, by the way, have you heard? And she said, heard what? She said, you also have a four-year scholarship to Liberty University. It pays to take a stand. My heart breaks today as I stand in this pulpit because we are allowing these freedoms to be taken out from under us and it doesn't seem to bother anyone. It doesn't seem to bother anybody that it is now against the law to pray at ball games. It doesn't seem to bother anybody that now, across the state of North Carolina and across the United States of America, the evil ACLU is sending letters to all the municipalities and they're saying, you can no longer pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the church doesn't seem to be concerned about the fact that we're being told, you can't mention the name of Jesus Christ any longer. That's what they said to the early church in the book of Acts. You can no longer pray. Preach in the name of Jesus. And you can no longer preach the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But thank God that church had the backbone to stand up. And they said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And they went on preaching. And they threw them in jail. And they prayed the jailhouse open. And they shook the Roman Empire all the way down to its knees. And Christianity began to spread to the ends of the world. And it's still alive and vibrant. But it's asleep in some areas. I can't understand how people can say, I love the Lord Jesus Christ who dipped His soul in hell for us. And yet at the same time, when the, the government says to us, you can't pray any longer in that name. Where is the church? Where are the people that name the name of Jesus? Where are the people today that would be willing to stand up and say, Hey, you're on forbidden territory when you tell me that I can't pray in the name of Jesus. We will pray in the name of Jesus Christ. That's what Return America is all about. We're trying to shake people to the very foundation. 
And say, don't you understand? Can't you realize that we've lost something in our lifetime and someday our children and grandchildren are going to sit around and say, what in the world did mom and dad do in their generation to get us in this predicament? Hezekiah said, there's going to be peace in my generation. And although my children are going to be taken off into foreign land and captivity, I'll let them worry about it. It doesn't really concern me. You cannot go into the landscape of this country without finding the part that Christianity has played in its foundation. There was, in the earlier days of our country, what was called the Black Regiment. The Black Regiment was a group of people that never fought on the battlefield. But I'll tell you what they did do. They fought in the pulpits. And they got the name, the Black Regiment, from the black robes. They wore as they stood in the pulpits and preached. King George III of England said he feared the black regiment more than he feared the soldiers. Because these preachers mounted their pulpit on Sunday morning and they had two messages. Message number one was the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They said that a man is saved only by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And they proclaimed that message openly, forcefully, with simplicity. But they had a second message. Because they looked around them and they recognized that their freedoms was about to be taken away. And so as they looked around, they stood in their pulpit, they preached the gospel, and then they said to that generation, we have been handed these freedoms. If we don't fight for them, we're going to lose them. The black regiment, that group of preachers, did something unusual. They stood in their pulpits on Sunday morning, preached the gospel, tried to get people saved, warned them about the king of England, warned them about parliament, warned them about them trying to come and intrude into their freedoms and remove their freedoms from them. And then on Sunday afternoon, they took the men of their church out in the field and trained them how to fight. Who did that? The pastors. The black regiment, as they were called we got a lot of preachers today that's taken off their black garments and put on yellow garments. they got a backbone about like a piece of spaghetti, even if they've got that, and that might be bragging on them even to say that. And they are afraid to stand up and open their blessed mouth. They are, as Isaiah said, they are dumb dogs that refuse to bark. Somebody sits in their auditorium that may have a lot of money, and if they, they dare not tread on unoccupied ground because they are afraid that somebody will withhold their tithes. I want to say to you today, you can withhold all the money you want to withhold. I don't think anybody here is going to do it. It's not going to stop me, buddy, from preaching what this blessed old book says and standing up for the freedoms that's been handed to us in this country. I can go on a stump and preach to the jaybirds, but brother, I will not, I will not silence my voice because there is a, there's a crisis in this country. Country, and we are losing our religious freedom. And if there's ever a time that people ought to stand up and be counted, if not for our sake, for the sake of our children and grandchildren, it's in this present hour. They trained their men how to fight the enemy. And those people they trained was called the Minute Men. One of my favorite heroes in that era was a man by the name of Jones Clark. 
Jonas Clark pastored in Lexington, Massachusetts for 56 years. He preached what I said a while ago. He stood in his pulpit and he preached the gospel. But he warned his people. He warned his people. If we don't fight for our freedoms, we're going to be in the same condition that our forefathers was in in England before they sailed to Holland. Therefore, we must fight. We've all heard the story of Paul Revere. But most of us have not heard where Paul Revere, Revere rode his horse to that night, that fateful night. The British attacked Boston. And the word is out that the British are going to move from Boston to Lexington. And then they're going to Concord. Because down at Concord, there's munitions stored there that the Minutemen have stored there waiting for the day of attack. So the word comes that the, that the British, at a set time, are going to leave Boston. They're either going to come by the road or across the water, heading towards Lexington, Massachusetts. The word comes to a man that he used to stand up in a tall belfry, church tower, and when they start moving towards Lexington, he used to put lights up there. And he used to put a light up there, one light if they're going by land. He used to put two lights up in that belfry if they're going to come by water. And Paul Revere is put on a boat and he, they move him across the Charles River onto the opposite side because they're afraid that he will be captured if they don't move him over there. So he's on, he's on the opposite side of the Charles River. And at 9 o'clock, he's looking across the river to the top of this belfry. Historians tell us that most of the members of that church were employed by the British. But there was one man in there that stood against them, and he stood for freedom. And he was willing to take the light up into the belfry of that church that evening. Paul Revere is standing on the opposite side of the Charles River, and he's got a horse by his side. It's kind of foggy that night, but he looks across the Charles River through the fog, and he looks up to the belfry. At 9 o'clock, there's no light. 10 o'clock, there's no light. Close to the midnight hour, he looks up there, and he sees two lights shining through the distant fog. And it says, you need to warn the people that the British are coming by water. And he got on his horse. And he started riding down through Lexington. And he knocked on the doors. And he said, the British are coming. The British are coming. The British are coming. And through the midnight, he rode through the towns and the corridors, warning them that the enemy that wanted to put them back under slavery was coming. But as he rode through Lexington... He ended his ride that night at the house of a man by the name of Jonas Clark, the preacher, who for 56 years preached the gospel and warned the people and prepared his minute men. And one of the reasons he went to the house of Jonas Clark was because down at that house there were two other great patriots, both of which had a bounty on their head. The British wanted to hang them. The British wanted to kill them. Samuel Adams and John Hancock was down at the house of Jonas Clark. Oh, I could spend hours here. Oh, thank God. For, for these dear saints. Thank God for people like John, uh, John Hancock. When John Hancock signed the declaration, he was the first one to sign it, and he wrote his name in large letters. That's the reason today somebody will say, when they ask you to sign a legal document, put your John Hancock here. What they mean is, make it legible. 
When John Hancock signed that great declaration, he said, I want my signature on here so large that when the King of England reads it, he'll have no problem understanding who signed it. Amen. And that night, John Hancock and Samuel Adams was down at the preacher's house. Wow. Did you hear what I said? The political was down at the spiritual. The political leaders had gathered at the house of the preacher. And now they're joined by Paul Revere. They prayed that night. Paul Revere eventually left that evening and made his way on down to Concord, towards Concord. He was captured by the British that night. He didn't make it to Concord. But that night, Samuel Adams, John Hancock, and Jonas Clark gathered around the Word of God because they knew in a few hours the British would be there. Early the next morning at 5.30, Pastor Clark gathered his minute men at the church. Most of the minute men that he has now gathered to fight the British are members of his church. The man that's in charge of the minute men is a man by the name of Mr. Parker. Mr. Parker was a deacon in Jonas Clark's church. And at 5.30, while the sun's in the process of coming up, Jonas Clark takes his Bible and he turns to the book of Judges, chapters 6 and 7, and he preaches to those minute men about Gideon. And he said to them that morning, as God blessed Gideon, so we believe God will bless us. And somebody that morning said to Mr. Jonas Clark, the pastor, Mr. Clark, do you believe that these men that are members of your church and uh, Mr. Parker over here and these other minute men that you've got here, do you believe that they know how to fight the enemy? Listen to what he said. He said, yeah, they know how to fight the enemy. I've trained them. And then he made this statement. We are prepared to die under the shadow of the roof of this church, if necessary, for the freedoms that's been given to us. He did not know that that was a prophetic statement. Because in a few hours, seven of Mr. Clark's members are lying under the shadow of that church roof, dead, killed by the British. And another of his members is laying on the front steps of the church in his own blood, killed by the British. Mr. Clark, do you believe these men can fight? We're prepared to die if necessary, for the freedoms that's been given to us. I want you to listen to me. We are worshiping right now in this church with the freedoms that we enjoy. We are now living in this country with the freedoms that we now enjoy. Because behind us there was a group of patriots that said, we're about to lose it. And rather than lose it, we'll die. That the next generation and the next generation won't have to sit around and wonder why we gave up what had freely been given to us. My question to us today is, why are we giving up? 
What has freely been given to us? And why is it that while we're losing it, it doesn't bother us? Why is it? Why is it that we have so deteriorated in this country that now we're having to get an amendment to our Constitution to even define the first institution that God set in place, the institution of marriage? Why is it? That they're telling us that we can no longer pray in that high and holy name that went to hell so that we could go to heaven and it no longer bothers us. Why is it that we took prayer and Bible study out of the public school and replaced it with metal detectors? Why is it we took the sanctity of virginity out of the public school and started giving young girls birth control pills. Why is it that since then we have had the Columbines? Why is it Young people are taking guns on public school campuses now and killing other young students and teachers and even themselves. And we're trying to bring in secular counselors, clinical psychologists to deal with the mind. And we fail to understand that the problem is a heart problem. Why is it that we've become humanistic in our thinking? Why is it that we've become secular in our deportment? And all of a sudden, the Bible don't mean anything. The book upon which this nation was founded means nothing. Sad to say to the average Christian. Or they pick it up and read it. They try to live by it. When George Washington was sworn in as a president, he picked the Bible up that he had placed his hand on, put it to his lips, and kissed it. And then he got his cabinet together, and they walked down three or four blocks, and he called a three-hour prayer meeting. And they prayed for wisdom to guide this nation. Why is it that when those people, British, marched through Lexington and all the way to Concord, there lay patriots in their blood And many of those people in Jonas Clark's church were elderly people. Many of them had been saved there. They had walked across the green grass and they had worshipped in that church and they'd heard Preacher Clark preach to them. They were saved on their way to heaven. They didn't have to fight. They didn't have to go to the place where their souls was lifted up to heaven. They didn't have to go to the place where they'd heard about their freedom, where they'd heard about their Savior. They didn't have to go there to fight. They could have chosen not to. But some of those elderly people that had gone into that building and listened to the songs of Zion and the sermons that lifted up and exalted the name of the Lord Jesus now lie in their own blood in the shadow of the church house. Why? Because they believe that the freedoms that brought the pilgrims to the shores of this country was worth not only living for, but dying for. 
Now you can't get people to live for Christ, much less die for Him. This is the most sophisticated humanistic society that America has ever produced. And many times when the crisis comes, we're not concerned about the spiritual any longer. It doesn't bother us that the loss of our freedoms is picking up momentum. And the things that our kids, the things that we enjoyed, our kids to a great degree right now, this very moment, can't do. What's the next generation about to face? If Jesus tarries his coming, what's your grandkids going to be facing? We're going to slide down the hill of depravity and we're picking up momentum. In the state of California, it is now a three-week requirement that children bring their bathrobes and their turbans and be given a three-week course on Islam. In the state of California, they are to memorize Portions of the Koran in the state of California, they are being asked to, to, memorize about, to memorize some of the leaders of Islamic religion. And if that's not enough, in a public school in the state of California, they are asked to practice jihad, holy war. And yet, if you go in that same school and take a Bible and name the name Jesus, you will be suspended. And one of the greatest enemies to America today is Islam. They have already said by the year 2022, they will fly their flag over the White House and the United States Capitol building right here in America. A religion of peace? I don't think so. Have we forgot 911? Have we forgot the call? Have we forgot our embassies? This nation was not founded upon Islam. This nation was not founded upon the Koran. This nation was founded upon Judeo-Christian principles and values. And while we allow them to come here and build their mosque in this world, you could not go to Saudi Arabia or Iran today and open up the Word of God and build a New Testament church there, lest you lose your head. They say you're preaching hate. No, I'm preaching truth. I love their souls. Jesus loves them. Jesus died for them. But nobody's going to heaven unless they go through Jesus Christ, the message that this book right here teaches and preaches. And while we are playing marbles, we're losing our freedoms. I don't have time to get into it. I'm going to go into this tonight. I hope you'll be here. I want, to, I want to tell you more about the founding of this nation. But in the immediacy of the moment, if you're not signed up to go to the rally, you ought to go. That rally is all about what I preached to you this morning. It is time that we say to the people in Raleigh that represent us, you're not representing us. Because the majority of the people of this state has already said in poll after poll, we want an amendment to our state constitution defining marriage as between one man and one woman. And two men down in Raleigh have held this in committee now for three years. They have put it into they have put it into a committee that has not been opened up since June of 2001. 
And it dies there. And we're saying to them, if you can't represent us, Return America is going to visit the counties that you represent. And we're going to say to them that come next election time, we will work to see that you go home and get an honest job. And we will see somebody that sees, see that somebody gets down there that represents what this Bible is all about. You say, well, preacher, we've got to be very careful. We don't want to offend anybody. Well, I want you to know I'm a Christian, and I can be offended, and I'm highly offended. When people tell me that I can't, no, listen, fee fi fo fum I'll smell smoke in the auditorium. Don't come and tell me that I can't pray in the name of Jesus. And don't tell me that our nation is progressing forward. We're in the throes of this generation. We're in the throes of corruption and decay. And it's not going to change until two things are changed. Number one, the home's going to have to be changed, and the church is going to have to be changed. And we're going to have to get up from this lethargy that we're in and say, there's a cause. And if I don't stand up and fight for this cause, then there's no need of me whining and complaining when I lose more of what I've already lost. I get so tired of these preachers that I've tried to contact in the last six months whining and complaining. I'm so tired of hearing it. Excuse me. I could puke. And I know how I feel, and I, I, try to, I wonder how God must feel. When He gave His Son, and then through history, He moved to establish the greatest republic on the top side of this earth, to a great degree, for the proclamation of the gospel, so that He could use this nation to give out the gospel to the ends of the world. And now we've got in our comfort zone, like Hezekiah, and say, well, there's going to be peace and prosperity. And whatever happens to my kids and grandkids, I'll be off the scene, and it don't really matter. So whatever happens, it'll just have to happen. I don't choose to live that way. Amen. I've gone day and night for six months, and I'm going to go day and night as long as I've got breath in this body to say it's time to wake up. And it's time that we recognize we've been handed something. But we may not be able to keep it. Because very few people are willing to stand up and be counted. I want to ask that we stand together with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. <laughs> no moving around, please, unless it's to the altar. Are we content... To let things rock on like they're rocking? Are we content? Are we satisfied to let our children experience what's coming on the scene? Or are we willing to do something about it? Have you ever stopped to analyze where it used to be versus where it's at? The very appearance of anything that represents Jesus Christ on the city square, in the business section, in the business sector of this country, is all of a sudden against the law. Where's it going to be next? I'll tell you where it's going to come. It's going to come in the doors of this building. Oh, you say, preacher, it, 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 it can't happen. Right now, Sheila Jackson has introduced hate crimes legislation in Washington, D.C. in the month of January. Nancy Pelosi says she's going to pass it. All I can tell you about hate crimes is I look at the other nations that's passed it, 
And I see what's happening there. So it'll happen here. Our neighbors up north in Canada, if they pass that, and I stand in this pulpit, and I read Romans chapter 1, or I talk about a perverse lifestyle, I will be open to arrest and fine. It's just around the corner. You say it can never happen in America. It's just around the corner. Because once you start caving in on religious freedom, it picks up momentum, and you lose more and more. Now, wait a minute. You don't do it all at one time. You wouldn't accept it if it happened all at one time. But when it happens piecemeal, people accept it. It's time we pray for this nation. It's time we stand up and be counted for this nation. And if we refuse to stand, then we may not be able to complain when... More of our freedoms have eroded from us than we have right now. All i got to say is if God's speaking to your heart about anything, anything you can do or anything you would say, Lord, I'm willing to do, you show me, I'm willing to do it. If God's speaking to you, I challenge you, don't be like Hezekiah. I'm going to live in the peace and prosperity of my generation. I'm not going to worry about the next generation. Don't let that be true of you. If God's speaking to you about anything, we sing one stanza of invitation. If you need to come, God's speaking to you about anything. Make your way down.